Let's say you're building an application to manage customers and their orders. You create a customer class, maybe you create an order class, and then you write code that gives your application the ability to add customers and change their addresses and record their sales, etc. And the application works fine. Now the company decides that rather than just sell to corporate customers, they're going to start selling to individual customers as well. So people can walk in off the street to the showroom and buy whatever it is you're selling. And now you're put in a position of having to ask yourself, is there just one type of customer or are there multiple types of customers? And do we need to account for differences as well as similarities between corporate customers and individual customers? Well, both corporate customers and individual customers have a name. So your customer class maybe originally had a customer name property. But the problem is that corporations typically have a name, whereas individuals have two names. They have a first name and a last name. Maybe the corporate customers have a sales representative and a credit limit. Individual customers, maybe they're entitled to a 10% discount on their birthday, so you need to keep track of that. But on the other hand, both corporate and individual customers have city, region, postal code, email address, phone number. And a lot of the methods that perform tasks for corporate customers are the same tasks as for individual customers, such as recording a sale or changing an address. So now you have an efficiency issue. On the one hand, you could create two different classes, one for corporate customers and one for individual customers. So you have a couple options on what to do here. On the one hand, you could take the customer class and copy it and make an individual customer class. But the problem here is that now you'll have two classes that have similar members. There are properties that are the same. There are methods that are the same. And if they exist in both classes, now you have a maintenance issue. You've got duplicated code. And if you make a change to the record sales method in the customer class, you'll also have to make a change to the same code in the individual customer class. Your other option would be to add into your one customer class all the properties needed by corporate customers and all the properties needed by individual customers. Do the same thing with methods. Well, now you have a class that has properties that aren't used. Because if you create an instance of the customer class that represents a corporate customer, then you have the birthday property that's not being used, as well as the first name and last name property. And if you create an instance of the customer class referring to an individual, then you have a customer name property that's not being used. So both of these options, copying classes and having duplicate code, or creating one class that has code that's not used, that's inefficient. What you really want to do is create a more generic class that represents a customer and that represents the things that all customers have in common. And then what you want to do is derive from that generic class and make specialized classes that represent corporate customers and individual customers. This generic class is a base class. And then the process of deriving from that is inheritance. So you can write a base class and then inherit from that class to create more specific classes. The benefit here is that derived classes inherit all the members of the base class. So your generic customer class would have properties and methods that are shared across all customers. Then you might create a corporate customer class that inherits from that. It gains all the common functionality. And then you would add to it properties and methods that are specific to a corporate customer. You do the same thing with the individual customer class. Now your common code exists in one place. That's the base class. And code that is specific to a type of customer would exist in that derived class. Well, inheritance is used to define an is a relationship. A corporation is a customer, and an individual is a customer. So you can create a customer base class and then inherit from that to get corporate customers and inherit from that to get individual customers. So one of the benefits of this is efficient coding. 
So as you design your classes, you'll create base classes and then inherit from those classes and derived classes. But in the calling code, you're insulated from knowing some of those details. You call a member of the class and it works as it's supposed to whether you're currently using a base or a derived class. So look at the following code. Corporate customer dot customer name equals app dev. We have an instance of the customer class. Maybe it's the base customer class. Maybe it's the derived corporate customer class. Doesn't matter. As long as that class has the property customer name, then we can set it equal to app dev. Is the customer name property declared in the base class, which is customer, or is it declared in the derived class, which is corporate customer? Again, it doesn't matter. As long as the property is available to us in our code, and it works as we expect it to, then we're fine. Same thing with methods. The individual customer will create an instance of the individual customer class and call the record sales method to record what was bought and how much it cost. Here again, we don't really need to know whether record sales is specific to an individual customer or whether the base customer class has a record sales method that takes two parameters, what was sold and how much it cost. It doesn't matter. That's one aspect of polymorphism. The other aspect is that you can have multiple classes that have members with the same name but do entirely different things. So here again we're calling the record sales method on an individual customer class, passing what was bought and how much it cost. And we also have a car class that has a record sales method. And the record sales method of the car class takes two parameters, but the first parameter is the month and the second parameter is the unit sold. So two members with the same name, but they do different things based on the class they're defined in. And polymorphism says that's okay because we're calling the record sales method of a specific class. When you create your classes, you're going to put common properties and methods in the base class. So in the example of customers, properties and methods that apply to all types of customers go in the customer class. Derived classes, such as corporate customer and individual customer, automatically inherit all of the members of the base class, but you can also add to these. So properties and methods that are unique to corporate customers would be added to the corporate customer class. Properties and methods that are unique to individual customers can be added to the individual customer class. Let's go see a demo of inheritance on how we can split code between base classes and derived classes. I have the sample application open and I'm looking at the file customer.vb. This code defines the customer class. And at this point, there's only one type of customer in this application. We've not gotten to the point where we're distinguishing between corporate customers and individual customers. We'll be doing that shortly. Right now, there's just one type of customer. The customer class has some constructors. And the customer class has properties for customer ID, customer name, city, region, postal code, country, annual sales, location, how long the customer's been a customer, and then total sales. And the customer class also has methods to retrieve customer information, save customer information, determine the location of a customer, record sales and orders, and make changes to the location. And we can use those properties and methods when we create an instance of the customer class. So let's run through that as a quick review. I'll run the sample application and choose the option to look at base class members. So we'll create an instance of the customer class and that's stored in the variable customer1 and then we can set properties such as customer name and we can call methods such as record sales. Record sales takes as a parameter the customer ID, the dollar amount of the sale, and the units sold. We can do the same thing with individual customers. First we did it for a corporate customer, big industries, 
Now let's sell something to an individual named John Smith. That's the customer name. And we'll record that Smith bought five units at $100 total. The record sales method writes this information to an XML file. So if we go look in the root directory, here's the sales to the corporate customer, big, written out as XML, customer ID, sales, and units. And here are the sales to the individual Smith. Again, written out customer ID, sales, units. So this is functionality that all customers have, and it's contained in the customer class. Well, now as we move along in the application over time, we decide that we really do need to distinguish between corporate customers and individual customers. So what we're going to do is inherit from the customer class. We'll create a corporate customer class that inherits from customer and an individual customer class that inherits from customer. Let's go take a look at those. So I'll open the file corporatecustomer.vb, and that defines the class corporate customer, which inherits from customer. So it automatically now gets all of the properties and methods that we saw in the customer class. And then we're going to add members that are specific to corporate customers. The corporate customer has a sales rep, so we'll add that property as a string. A corporate customer also has a credit limit. We'll add a property for that as an integer. Then we'll add a method called change credit limit. You pass in an amount, either positive or negative, and the credit limit is incremented or decremented by that amount. Then we're going to create a version of the record sales method that's specific to customers. We'll be looking at that a little bit later on. And so we've added to the corporate customer class two methods and two properties that are specific to corporate customers. Let's look at the individual customer class. That's in the file individualcustomer.vb. That also inherits from customer. And so again, it gains all the members that are in the customer class. We're then going to add properties that are specific to individual customers, such as first name and last name. Now the customer class has a customer name property. And that was already in there. And we're inheriting from that. So the individual customer class has a customer name property. So we're actually going to create a different version of the customer name property that adds the first name and last name together. Individual customers get a discount on their birthdays, so we need to know the birthday month and the birthday day. So we'll add properties for those. And then finally, individuals get their own version of the record sales method, and we'll look at that later on as well. So we've added members to both the individual customer and the corporate customer classes. So they have many members in common, but some members that are specific to each. So let's look at how we use these in code. I'll run the inherited members example. And we're going to create a new instance of the corporate customer class and store it to the variable customer1. Now customer1, because it inherits from customer, has all of the properties that were in the customer class, city, country, postal code, region, etc. It also has properties and methods that were added to the corporate customer class, such as credit limit and sales rep. And the key thing is that we're using an instance of the corporate customer class. So customer one has all of these properties. And we don't necessarily need to remember or know or account for the fact that in this example, sales rep was defined in the derived class, postal code was derived in the base class. It doesn't matter because it's a property that's available to us when we work with an instance of the corporate customer class. And so here, 
We set the customer name of this customer, and we record sales. Next, we'll create an instance of the individual customer class. That's customer two. Just like customer one, customer two inherits from the customer class. And so it also has properties like region, postal code, country, that come from the customer class. And then it has properties that are specific to individual customers. Birthday day, birthday month, for example. And also first name and last name. And because they are inherited from the customer class, they're available to individual customers. Here we'll set the customer name, and we'll call the record sales method. So you can see that in both examples, we called the customer name property and the record sales method the exact same way. In the first example, we're only working with one class. In the second example, there's a corporate customer class that inherits from customer and an individual customer class that inherits from customer. But when we call the members of the classes, we don't need to do anything differently. And let's go back to the menu and look at calling added members. We saw that we added some properties and methods to the corporate customer and individual customer classes to account for behavior that's specific to that type of customer. So now we'll create an instance of the corporate customer class. We'll assign a customer name, and then we'll assign a sales rep to this customer and enter a credit limit. So customer name comes from the customer class, sales rep, and credit limit were added to the corporate customer class. Now what we'll do is we'll record some sales for this customer, and let's step into this. Let's now record the fact that this customer made a purchase, purchased 500 units for a total of $100,000. And let's step into record sales. Notice that we're calling the record sales method in the customer class. So we're not using a version of record sales that's specific to a corporate customer. This is the general or generic functionality that has been in the customer class all along. We'll step out of this, and the sale is recorded. Now we're going to change the credit limit. And our rule is that every time you make a purchase, your credit limit goes up by 10% of that purchase. So we're going to pass to the change credit limit method one-tenth of the amount. We'll step into that. Change credit limit is defined in the corporate customer class. This is an added member. It was added to this class because it's specific to corporate customers. And we'll now increase the customer's credit limit by $10,000 and their credit limit is now $110,000. That information gets displayed, and now we move on to working with individual customers. So let's create an instance of the individual customer class, and this is represented by customer two. We'll give this customer a name. The first name is John, the last name is Smith, and the customer name is the two of those together. That's John Smith. John was born on May 30th, so we'll set the birthday month property to 5 and the birthday day property to 30. And now John walks into the store and makes a purchase. John's going to buy something for $100, and what we want to do is determine whether or not John gets a discount because it's his birthday. So if today's month is equal to the customer's birthday month and also today's day is equal to the customer's birthday day, then the customer gets a 20% discount and a congratulations. Otherwise, we say sorry, no discount today, and then we record the sale. So today is not John's birthday. John gets no discount. The sale is recorded as the full hundred dollars. 
What you've seen in this demo is that we started out this application with a customer class that represented all customers. And then eventually, we decided we needed to distinguish between individual and corporate customers. So we created the corporate customer class and the individual customer class, and those both inherit from customer. Therefore, all of the members in the customer class are now automatically in the individual customer and corporate customer class. And then we added members specific to individuals and corporates to those appropriate classes. And then when we write code, we create instances of classes, and then we just use the properties and methods that those classes provide. You saw previously that you could create derived classes from base classes, and that the derived classes automatically gain the members of the base class. You also saw that you could add members to the derived classes. So for example, add properties or methods that didn't exist in the base class, and you'll do that when you have functionality specific to a derived class that you need to write code for. But what about the members in the base class that automatically flow through to the derived class? Sometimes, you'll want to make changes to those. And there are a couple ways you can do that. One is you can override a property or method in the derived class to change its behavior. And when you do that, you're replacing the base class member with the derived class member. So a good example of that is the customer name property. Customer name is a member of the customer class. The corporate customer has a customer name property. And that behaves the same way it behaved in the customer class, so there's no reason to touch that. But the individual customer class also gets the customer name property. And the customer name should be the combination of the first name and the last name. So we've added first name and last name properties to the individual customer class. And then we'll change the way the customer name property works so that it automatically returns whatever the value of the first name and last name is. So overriding a member is replacing a member. You can also overload members. When you overload a property or method of a base class, you're creating a different version in the derived class. You haven't overridden the base class member. That still exists, and you can still use it, but you've now added a member of the same name that takes a different number of parameters and therefore performs the task differently in the derived class. So a good example of this is the record sales method. There's a record sales method in the customer class that accounts for sales that are common regardless of the type of customer. But there are also record sales methods in the corporate customer and individual customer classes that take additional parameters and are more of a specialized version of recording sales. Sometimes when you overload a base class member, you don't want to replace the functionality that it does. You want to add to it. So for example, suppose when you record a sale to an individual customer, you want to send them a thank you email after you record the actual sale. The customer class, which is the base class, has a record sales method. You then want to create a record sales method for the individual customer that runs the same code, and after that, then sends an email. Well, you're certainly not going to take the code from the base class method and copy it into the derived class. What you really want to do is from the derived class member, call the method of the base class, and then add code in the derived member to send the email. And happily, you can do that. So let's go see a demo of overriding and overloading members and then calling back into the base class members. I have the sample application up and running. Let's take a look at overriding members. Let's first create an instance of the corporate customer class. And we'll assign customer1 a customer name of Big Industries. And we'll display that. So nothing new here. The customer name property has been in the customer class all along. And when we created the corporate customer class, which inherits from customer, 
we saw no reason to change the way customer name behaves. Corporate customers have a name, such as big industries, and the customer name property was designed to account for that, so we'll just use it as is in the derived class. But then we created the individual customer class, and that refers to an individual. And now, this idea of customer name needs a little bit of thought. Let's create a new instance of the individual customer, and we added to this individual customer class a first name property and a last name property, because that's typically how you refer to a customer by name. And we added to the individual customer class properties for first name and last name. Well, because individual customer inherits from the generic customer class, it automatically gets a customer name property. Well, there are three possibilities on what we can do here. One, we could have decided that customer name only applies to corporate customers, and that individual customers will just have first name and last name. So at that point, we could have decided to remove the customer name property from the customer class, the base class, and move it into the corporate customer class, which is the derived class. Well, that's a bad idea, because there's no doubt a lot of existing code that creates an instance of the customer class and uses the customer name property. So if you move properties or methods out of base classes, you can break existing code. And that's never a good thing. The second thing we could have done is inherited the customer name property into the individual customer class and then just ignored it. Well, that wouldn't have broken any existing code, but now you've got code that's never used. A third possibility, and the one we're using here, is to change what it means to have a customer name property in the individual customer class. So after setting the first name and last name properties, let's see what happens when we query for the value of the customer name property. So let's step into this, and you can see that we have a new version of the customer name property. It's still a string, but this version is meant to replace the version in the customer class. So we're overriding the base class's customer name property, and to do that, we specify overrides in the declaration. And now, we add code specific to the individual customer class. So when we query the customer name for an individual, we're going to return a combination of the first name plus a space plus the last name. So that's what this code does. It creates a single string, of the user's name and returns that to the calling code. Now let's create another instance of the individual customer class, and this time we'll assign Mary Jones to the customer name property. And so in the setter, we have the following code. The value passed in is Mary space Jones, and what we want to do is extract the first name and the last name from this. Well, the first thing we need to do is find out where the space is, because everything to the left of the space is the first name, everything to the right of the space is the last name. So we can use the index of method of the string class to find where the space is. And that will return a 4. And it's a 4 because indexes are zero based. So the capital M is character 0. A-R-Y is characters 1, 2, and 3, and the space is character 4. Then, we use the substring method and say everything from position 0 through position 4 is the first name. And everything starting one position past the space to the end of the string is the last name. And we've now extracted the first name and the last name, and we'll store those in the appropriate properties. So now, when we set customer name equal to Mary Jones, the first name is automatically set to Mary, the last name is automatically set to Jones. So we've left the customer property alone in the corporate customer class, but we've overridden it in the individual customer class and added functionality specific to individuals. So overriding is when you replace a member. You can also overload members. 
and that adds a new version without getting rid of the original version. Let's see that. We'll create an instance of the corporate customer class, and this customer has a customer ID of big. Well, big customers have sales reps. The sales rep property was added to the corporate customer class. It's one of the things that distinguishes corporate from individual customers. So we'll set the sales rep to be equal to Ed. And now we want to record sales. Recording sales writes the sales information to an XML file. The customer class has a version of record sales, but it takes customer ID, sales amount, and units. But if the customer has a sales rep, we also want that to be recorded as well. So that means we need a new version of record sales that takes four parameters. The customer ID, the sales rep, and then the amount and the units. So let's run this code and see what that method looks like. Inside the corporate customer class, we've added a version of the record sales method that takes a sales rep as a parameter in addition to the customer ID and the sales information. And so that's an overloaded method, and to specify that, we use the overloads keyword. This method does very similar things to the original version, but what makes it unique is that it writes the sales rep information to the XML file. Let's step out of that and go and look at the XML file that's written for big sales, and this XML includes the sales rep in addition to the other information. Now let's create another instance of the corporate customer class, but this time the customer is small. Small customers don't have sales reps. And so we can use the original version of the record sales method, the one that's in the customer class. So we'll call that, and we write just as before, the sales file for this customer that includes the customer ID, sales, and units. So we have a derived class, corporate customer, that's using two different versions of the record sales method. For the small customer, we use the method that was inherited from the base class. But for the big customer, we overloaded the method, in other words, created a new version that takes a different number of parameters to record sales in a manner that's specific to bigger customers. The final demo we want to look at is calling base class members. There will be time in your derived classes when you want to be able to call code that's in the base class. Let's see an example of that. Let's create an instance of the individual customer class. This customer is Smith and Smith was born on May 30th. And the reason we want to know when the customer was born is because on your birthday you get a 20% discount. Smith was born on May 30th. Let's create another customer, Jones, and let's have Jones be born today so that we can show the 20% discount. So Jones was born today. Now, we're going to call the record sales method in the individual customer class. I have a breakpoint on that, so let's run the code and see how it works. This is an overloaded method, because in addition to recording the customer ID and the sales and the units, we need to compare the birthday month and the birthday day to today. Now, in a previous example, we saw doing that calculation in the calling code. Before we recorded the sale, we checked to see if the sale was eligible for a discount. Well, in this version, we're moving that code into the class so that it happens automatically. So if today's month is equal to the customer's birthday month, which for the first customer it wasn't, and today's day was equal to the customer's birthday day, then we would have adjusted the sales. For this customer, we don't do that. Now we want to record the sales. Well, we have a method to do that. It's the record sales method in the customer class. So all we've done here in this overloaded version of record sales is some pre-processing, if you will. 
and now we want to call the record sales method from the base class. Well, we can do that by using the my base keyword. My base dot record sales refers to the record sales method in the base class, which in our case is customer. So we'll record the sales for that customer, and that gets written to the file Smith underscore sales, and Smith bought 50 units for $1,000. Now, let's record the sales for Jones, whose birthday is today. If today's month is equal to the birthday month, which it is, and also today's day is equal to the birthday day, then good news for the customer, Jones gets a 20% discount. So we adjust the sales figure which is currently a thousand and reduce it by 20 percent to 800 and now we want to record the sale so again we'll call the record sales method in the base class and record the fact that Jones got a 20 percent discount and the amount of the sale was 800 So what you've seen in this example is that you can override members of a base class. And when you override a member, you replace the base class member with a version specific to the derived class. You can also overload members. That does not replace the original member in the base class, but it adds a specialized version in the derived class. Overloaded members are identified using the overloads keyword, and they differ by the parameters they take. And finally, you saw that you can call members of the base class from inside a derived class by using the MyBase keyword. So you have the ability to declare a generic class or a base class and inherit all of that functionality, but then also by adding, overriding, and overloading members, you have the ability to add specialized functionality to your derived classes, and now you have the ability to create inheritance hierarchies that meet the needs of your applications. So far in this section, we've used a customer class as our base class, and then we've derived from that and created the corporate customer class and individual customer class. Those inherit from the customer class, and they gain the properties and methods of the customer class. Well, the customer class started out as a usable class, and so it has code in the properties and code in the methods, and you can create an instance of that class to represent a customer. And then the derived classes, corporate customer and individual customer, have additional code to add properties or methods that are specific to that type of customer, or to override or overload members of the base class. So earlier we said that base classes are generic in the sense that they have functionality that's common across, in this instance, customers. But you can make a base class even more generic. You can make it an abstract class. And an abstract class is not only generic, but it's incomplete. And it's incomplete because it doesn't have in it enough code to be usable. Now, why would you do this? You can think of a class as a template or a blueprint. It gives you instructions on how to create something. That's an instance of the class. Could be that there's enough information in that blueprint to tell you how things like recording sales or recording the customer name should occur. But it could also be that your blueprint is nothing more than instructions that say you will implement a class called customer name, you will implement a class called record sales that will take these parameters and return this value, but it's your job to write the code to make that happen. An abstract class tells you what members the instances are going to have, but you can't create an instance of the abstract class. You have to derive from it and then add the rest of the code to make the class usable. Now your abstract class can have abstract members. So you could, for example, have an abstract class that didn't implement the properties, but did have code to implement the methods. 
and so it would have only abstract properties. Or vice versa, maybe you write the code to implement the properties, but you leave the methods abstract. In either case, the derived classes cannot call the abstract members, they have to implement them on their own. So you have to derive from an abstract class. You can't use the actual abstract class itself, you can only use classes that inherit from it. The flip side to that are sealed classes and members. You'd seal a class to prevent anyone from inheriting from it. And you can seal a member in a derived class to prevent further derived classes from overriding it. Now why would you do that? Well you might have a class that does exactly what you need it to do and you want people to be able to use it but you don't want them to be able to change the behavior. Maybe this is code that encrypts a password. So you've written this code in a class and you want it to be usable but you don't want it to be changed. And in that situation you might seal it. Anyone can use it but no one can inherit from it and if you can't inherit from something you can't override or overload the methods. So let's go to demo and see how you can create and use abstract and sealed classes and members. I'm in the sample application and I'm looking at the customer class. The customer class has a number of properties and a number of methods and there's a fair amount of code in here to implement the properties as well as implement the methods such as saving customer information by writing it out to XML, a couple different versions of that, determining the location of a customer if all you know is the customer ID, recording sales, recording orders, etc. There's a fair amount of code in here. And then the corporate customer class inherits from this and gains all that functionality and the individual customer class inherits from this as well and gains all that functionality. But let's now look at an abstract version of the customer class. The file abstractCustomer.vb defines the class named abstractCustomer. And you can see that it has the same properties and methods as the customer class, but what it doesn't have is any code to implement these. The class itself is declared abstract by using the must inherit keyword which gives us a clue that we can't use this class, we have to inherit from it. This abstract class has three constructors, just like the original customer class. The empty one, the constructor that takes these parameters, and then this third one, but there's no code in here to do anything. There's also a list of the properties that a class that inherits from this must implement, but again, no code to do anything. And these properties are declared abstract by using the must override keyword. So when we inherit from the abstract customer class, we have to override these properties, which we'll want to do because we'll want to write code to have these properties do something. Similarly, for the methods. Here's the list of each of the methods Well, let's try and create an instance of this class. I'm going to say dim cust as new. And of course, here's customer, or here's corporate customer. That's in there. But if I try and say dim cust as new abstract customer, notice that abstract customer doesn't appear in IntelliSense. That's my first clue that this isn't going to work. And then I get an error, new cannot be used on class abstract customer because it contains a must override member that has not been overridden. In other words, you can't actually use the abstract customer class. What you can do is inherit from it. Let's comment this out so our code will compile if we need it to. And then let's look at the customer2 class, which inherits from abstract customer. So public class 2 is defined as inheriting from abstract customer. And then there's a bunch of empty code in here. Well, watch what happens. Let's actually back up a step and let's create a new class. 
we'll just call it test I'll replace it and we'll inherit from abstract customer notice that now abstract customer shows up in the IntelliSense because I can inherit from this class and when I do that Visual Basic automatically adds to my class placeholders for all the properties and methods that I need to override and specifies that these are overriding so here are the properties down here are some methods the get customer info get customer name get location record sales so all of the properties and methods that were defined in the abstract customer class are now in this test class which inherits from abstract customer let's look at another abstract class the abstract customer 2 version again is marked as must inherit to denote that it's abstract but notice here that we're implementing the properties. The properties are not abstract. However, the methods are. We scroll further down. Here are the methods that must be implemented by whatever inherits from abstract customer 2. So you can choose which of the members are abstract and which aren't. And now, if we create a new class, call it test override the existing version and we say inherits abstract customer 2 then the only thing that's going to be added here automatically are the placeholders for the methods we need to implement because the properties are not abstract they're automatically derived so I could say console dot right line me dot and there's the city the customer name the location etc so in your derived class you only have to add the functionality for abstract methods any member that's not abstract flows into the derived class in the same way we saw earlier in this section let's now take a look at a sealed class sealed customer dot VB contains the definition for the sealed customer class and all I did here was copy all the code in the customer class into the sealed customer class and then I marked it not inheritable which says that you can use this class to your heart's content but you can't inherit from it let's go into the main module here and let's create a procedure to work with sealed classes and we can dim sealed cust as new sealed customer and we can now use this class as we would any of the other customer classes but what we cannot do is the following let's add a class we'll call this test2 and let's do this inherits notice that sealed customer doesn't appear in IntelliSense always our first clue that this isn't going to work and the message is cannot inherit from class sealed customer because sealed customer is declared not inheritable in other words it's sealed you can use it but you can't inherit from it you can also seal methods let's look at the definition for customer 3 this customer 3 class inherits from the abstract customer 2 class and then in this derived class we're implementing code to fill out this version of record sales but we've also marked this as not overridable that is how we seal this class so now anything that inherits from customer 3 is not able to override this method corporate customer 3 inherits from customer 3 and watch what happens if we now try and override this method 
We can't because it's declared not overridable. So you've seen in this demo abstract and sealed classes and members. An abstract class cannot be instanced. It can only be inherited from. And that's because it doesn't contain enough code to actually be used. You have to inherit from it and add the missing code. You can declare the entire class to be abstract. You can declare some or all of the properties and methods in it to be abstract. But anything that's abstract needs to be inherited from, and then you need to add the code to implement it. The flip side to that is sealing. You can seal a class. You then can't inherit from it. You can just use it. You can also seal a method in a derived class, and any class that inherits from that class cannot override that method. 